So I am going to present now uh, such this topic, AIB mediated promoterless gene targeting. That is an approach that is a gene targeting approach to correct uh, liver diseases. Then uh, Professor uh, Bush will talk, so this will remain. And after uh, the coffee break, Professor Fuchs will, will do the presentation in the program. He, he, the, his slot was now. So, this is, uh, I will present today the, the, what we are doing. W one of the main projects we are doing in the laboratory, we have two main projects. One is this one, that is gene targeting uh, approach. Just both of them are, are, are let's say, the, the goal is to correct uh, liver metabolic diseases by these two different approaches. This one is gene targeting, I will explain more uh, later. And the other one will be tomorrow, that is, a, let's say, classical gene targeting in the sense that we are not modifying the, the genome. It's a AAB mediated gene targeting approach to correct a, a disease that is Krigler Najjar. The, the model is the, this one, so some of the information that I will give you today in this regarding the model will be also uh, used tomorrow because it's the same model. So, just to explain a bit more, we are dealing with inborn errors of, of metabolism. What is this? This is, a, let's say, a metabolic pathway that goes from a substrate to a product, and then if this metabolic pathway is interrupted because of the mutation of a, one enzyme that, that participates, then we can have or an increase of substrate because it is not processed anymore and this could be toxic and this is the case of our, our disease, you will see later. Or you could have also a deficiency in the product and, and this is also uh, dangerous for, for, the, for the individual, activation of different pathways or eventually this could be resolved by, by secondary pathways that take over the, the intermediate metabolite. So, many of these processes occur in the liver, and this is what we are going to, to see today. Uh, so, the, the liver is an important organ in the body that, uh, let's say, takes care of many of these uh, uh, metabolic pathways, and uh, as such, in, there are many diseases that affect the liver. Uh, what is important to know also is that normally these metabolic processes are in excess. So we don't need 100% of enzyme activity to, to be uh, healthy. So in many cases you need only 2, 5, 10, 20% depending on the pathway just to, to be healthy, to, to have a normal a metabolic process. So, but when this happens, so there are different uh, approaches to treat. Uh, the, the, let's say the most uh, used one, or I, in, in most of the cases, or the curative one really, is liver transplantation. Liver transplantation is a very invasive um, procedure that involves just taking out the damage, the organ without the mutation. In many cases, the organ is absolutely normal except for the missing function. So it is really a pity to change the whole organ just to replace one enzymatic function. And it has many problems as I indicated here. So you have the problem of organ compatibility. Just after transplantation you need a lifelong immunosuppression. And this results in increased risk of other diseases. You have increased risk of cancer, or you are immunosuppressed, that uh, could have some consequences. This is also another important factor to, to consider, is that in the case of krigler najjar patient, in which the liver is absolutely normal, you have more or less 90-95% of patient survival at five years. It means that one in 10 or one in 20 of the transplanted patients die because of the, of the procedure. And in many cases, you have to retransplant the organ with, so repeating the same problems. Many of these diseases are, could be cured by enzyme replacement therapy. 
enzyme replacement therapy consists in the uh, administration of the recombinant protein to the patient, which also has, has some limits. In some cases, the, the, um, the enzyme could be immunogenic, and it normally has very high cost. And when we talk very high, high cost, we are talking about more or less 200,000 euros per year per patient. So if we do this for 30 years, 40 years, you can do your calculation. So it is really very high cost. And then, so we are developing gene therapy and gene editing approaches just in order to, to resolve this clinical need. So what is gene therapy? So we have talked yesterday something already about uh, <coughs> gene therapy. We have seen also the, the vectors that could be used, and we can define gene therapy as the introduction of nucleic acid into cells with the goal of modifying gene expression to prevent, stop, or reverse pathological processes. This is the way we use, we use gene therapy. And obviously, we can do a lot of things. What just imagination is only the limit in, in gene therapy. And we have mainly two different processes that we have already seen yesterday, so I will just very fast repeat. We can do in vivo gene therapy, so we have the organism and we infuse our gene therapy product directly into the, the patient. Or we can take cells from the patient, modify the cells in, in the laboratory, and then select the modified cells and reinfuse the, the corrected cells. This is normally done for hematopoietic cells, uh, and it is, uh, we have seen yesterday some examples. Okay, in the case of the liver, uh, which are the characteristics of a disease to be selected for, for, for gene therapy approach? Essentially, they are much easier if we have only one gene to correct, one organ, because in some cases we have more than one organ. If we have animal models in which we can test our therapies, and then if the therapeutic goal is modest, then obviously since gene therapy is still at the beginning, uh, we can uh, succeed in the, in the procedure. So this is the example that I'm going to tell you today. We, we also hemophilia is one of these uh, examples. So this, also, this point is also very important because if we don't have a, a very simple assay to determine the therapeutic efficacy of the procedure, then everything gets more complicated. Obviously, we have to select patients or animals in which the disease still has not advanced, so it is not producing, uh, let's say, damage or permanent damage, because in most of the cases when we have permanent damage, we cannot reverse the, this feature. And then, well, a wide level of range of uh, levels is, well, we can skip this. So, there are liver diseases we can classify in different groups according to, to the damage and to the expression of the, of, of the genes. So, in some cases, we have expression in the liver, so this is perfect. So we can think about this type of diseases, but if the liver has parenchymal damage, then any type of intervention using a gene therapy approach will be more complicated because we are not going to succeed because the liver is already damaged and cells are, are different, are proliferating, and we also have fibrotic tissue that avoid also the, that the vector could reach all places in the liver. So these are let's say, the, the right uh, selection in which we have a monogenic disease with hepatic expression uh, and without parenchymal damage. So in this case, the, this is the, the primary target of the gene therapy approaches that we are doing now in, in, in the gene therapy field. So the, the classical ones are urea cycle disorder as OTC. We have seen yesterday OTC. This one, this model also is very used, that is Krieger-Nagel syndrome, that we are, we are using this one. And also, we also have metabolic uh, um, a, a coagulation uh, defects that uh, hemophilia A and B, 
and also lysosomal storage disorder in some cases. And then we have other diseases in, to which it is very complicated to do gene therapy because if we, uh, they are expressed, the gene is expressed not only in the liver but in other, in another organ. So the main, the gold standard of this is to know whether if we do liver transplantation, we cure the disease. If this is the case, then we can do liver gene therapy. If we do liver transplantation and we don't cure the disease, then the situation becomes complicated to do a gene therapy approach because we probably are not, even if we cure the liver, this will not be enough to cure the disease. So we talked yesterday about adeno-associated virus. They are parvovirus in strands in which we replace it just the, the viral genes by our cassette that could be this one or could be any other. So we have already seen this. This approach has been used, as we have seen also yesterday, for hemophilia B, in which a, a cassette with a liver-specific promoter, that is this one tissue-specific promoter, here it is the, the factor 9 uh, cDNA, was transduced into patients with very good uh, results, lasting with levels that range at about 30% in, in average between all the patients, that is more than enough to avoid infusion of the recombinant uh, factor to, to all the treated patients. We are also doing this approach, as I mentioned, in a consortium that is called, that is called the CURE-CN consortium, so CURE, CLEAR, CRIGLER, NAJAR. To, tomorrow you will listen about that. Okay, so, but w what is the point? In, in these cases, we are treating adult animals, uh, adult, sorry, adult, adult patients, and also in, a, in our approach so, so far. But many of the liver diseases have a pediatric onset. And what does it mean? That, what happens? Which, which are the consequences of that? We have seen yesterday that the, the vector that is the best vector that we have so far to treat liver diseases is the adeno-associated virus, which is based in the presence of episomal DNA that is DNA that gets not integrated into the chromosome. And as such, they are separate entities. When the cell divides, chromosomes go, they, they go to the daughter uh, cell, but the DNA of the virus is not duplicating and gets lost, and, and there is a portion of it that gets degraded. So the, the point is that when the liver grows, as you can see here in mice or humans, then there is a loss of uh, viral DNA, with the obviously loss also of the therapeutic efficacy. Uh, so this is a very big problem if we have to treat very young kids because the therapy that we are going to, to give them will not be effective for a long period. But this is the idea of gene therapy. We, in some cases we can delay, so this is uh, not a simple graphic, this is bilirubin. So if bilirubin is low it means that it works. If we, for example, with those animals at P11, that is the, this line after seven months, so the, the therapeutic uh, efficacy is low. If we dose at P14, then it's partially low. If we dose at P18, then it is maintained. Uh, and this is due because if we uh, dose the animals when the liver is larger or it has already grown, then the cell divisions that have to that occur in the liver after administration of the vector, then are less, and then there is less loss of uh, therapeutic efficacy. So this can be done in some cases, as the Krigler Najar you will see later. In some cases, the disease is very severe, and you cannot do that, because the patient will die, will not arrive to a later age in which the liver has already developed. And the consequence of this is that when you administer the vector to, to a patient or to an animal, then you have an immune response. It's like a vaccination with the vector. So there is a rise in neutralizing antibodies, and then this avoids to um, 
the possibility of reinfusion of the vector. Because if we reinfuse the vector, then all the vectors will be blocked by the neutralizing antibodies and the therapy will not be efficacious. Is it clear? So this is a very big problem. So if we inject early in edge, we lose activity, but at the same time, we cannot reinfuse because we have neutralizing antibodies. So how can we resolve this, uh, this problem? This problem, in some cases, we can resolve, resolve, just as I mentioned before, delaying the moment in which we dose the, the patient. This is not possible in all diseases. In some cases, it is possible. So we are doing this in Krigler-Najjar, for example. So we can also modulate the immune response. We can, if we block the, the activation of the immune system, will not produce neutralizing antibodies against the vector, and probably will be able to re-administer the therapeutic uh, vector again later in time. And this is also possible. So there are many groups that are working in this strategy. We are also working. I'm not going to show anything about this. But we are collaborating with a, with a biotech company in the States that they have developed uh, nanoparticles loaded with rapamycin that block the immune response when they are co-administered with the vector, allowing the re-administration later in time. So these, so far, they are just preclinical studies done in animals. Uh, there is a clinical trial going on, not for gene therapy, for another purpose. And then this, we are planning just to, to do this type of approach also in the clinical trial of ornithine transfer vanillase deficiency. That's, I'm not going to talk about this today. Other possibility is when we have antibodies, we take the blood of the patient, we pass the blood, the plasma, through a colon that removes specifically the antibodies of, of, the, of the plasma. <coughs> and then during a period, this, uh, there will be a window in which this patient will not have neutralizing antibodies because, because we have to remove all of them, and there is a time to, repro to produce again the antibodies. So during this window, we can eventually reinfuse the, the patient. And this is a very good, could be also a very good solution. Another solution could be the permanent modification of the genome. That is what we are going to see today. So the concept essentially is very simple, theoretically. So we have our gene that is mutated. We have our donor DNA that, is, that contains the wild type uh, sequence. And then we put everything in the cell. There is homologous recombination. And then it ends up with, with the corrected gene. And the corrected gene starts to produce the, the wild type protein. Uh, that is not, let's say, so everything is not so straightforward as I mentioned here. So this is what the, the, the focus of the, of the talk. Uh, so we are dealing with bilirubin metabolism. That is this disease that I mentioned before, that is krigler najjar that results. Bilirubin is the, the catabolic product of the heme groups that are present in red cells or myoglobin and uh, cytochromes in the liver. And then it is converted into unconjugated bilirubin, that is a, a lipid-soluble uh, entity that is transported in, in the blood bound to albumin. And then when it reaches the liver, just the, this uh, molecule has to be eliminated. And when it reaches the liver, then it is conjugated by this enzyme, UGT1A1. And this conjugated bilirubin then becomes soluble and is eliminated in the bile fluid and goes to intestine and, and disappears, let's say. But when this enzyme is not working because of different reasons, then there is a buildup of bilirubin in the, in the plasma. And when the albumin binding capacity is saturated, bilirubin starts to accumulate in lipophilic tissues, such as the brain and then produces brain damage, reaching, in some cases, well, permanent damage and eventually death of the, of the patient. This could happen because of a genetic mutation in, in the UGT1A gene, or in the case of neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, could happen that uh, Joseph will, will mention something. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
to today uh, could happen also because of a delay associated to some other causes in the activation of the of the gene after birth that disappears uh, a few days uh, later. So the Kringler major locus, the or mutations in the UGT one A one may lead to different syndromes that are these three that I indicate here and then the they are related to the mutation that is present in, in the genome that results in different uh, enzyme activity. Obviously, you have less enzyme activity, you have more unconjugated bilirubin levels, and obviously the need of more treatment. And the treatments normally are not uh, enough. The main treatment that is given to this patient that you, have, you can see here that the patient is jaundiced, so it is yellow because of the coloration of bilirubin. Uh, and the, the main treatment that is given is phototherapy, that is just irradiation with a light of a blue light that is 450 nanometers for 12, 14 hours per day. So you can imagine uh, how is the, the normal life of those patients that have to be 14 hours per day under the lamp. And in addition, uh, the, this treatment is when the patient grows up, the skin gets thicker, the ratio volume surface is different, and the efficiency of this treatment decreases, bilirubin rises, and then patients have to, to increase the hours of, of therapy or to do liver transplantation. So the, the idea of what we are doing is just find a therapy to avoid uh, to improve the, the life of those patients, uh, avoiding the risk of, of uh, liver transplantation. So we are doing gene therapy and genome editing of this uh, disease. And this is important because this disease, as I mentioned, is a, a very good, uh, let's say, disease just to treat because it is lethal. The liver is really no, uh, normal with 5-10% with just we reduce the bilirubin in plasma to safe levels, and with 10, 15, it is uh, absolutely normal, more or less, 15, 20 percent. We have animal models. It is possible to determine, as I mentioned before, we need a, a test to determine uh, the metabolite, and if this is very, let's say, used uh, biochemical test, a routine biochemical test, so we determine directly in blood without killing the animal. If the test is if the therapy is working or not, and then the alternative is that uh, I'm going to show is genome editing using uh, nucleases or without nucleases, and then if everything does not work, we still can do phototherapy and liver transplantation. So we are not uh, affecting really the the possibilities for other therapies to the patient, which is very good because if we do the therapy and it doesn't work, but we don't give the, the, the patient another alternative, this is not uh, viable. Okay, so the animal model is this one. So we, we did, uh, by classical uh, gene targeting, the introduction of a one base mutation into the exon 4 of the UGT1A1 gene, which results in a stop colon immediately after the the, the introducing mutation, and this is the mutant allele. It lacks all this region, which lacks the transmembrane domain, so the protein is not bound to the endoplasmic reticulum, and it, it is rapidly degraded. These are the animals. You can clearly see the jaundice one and the normal ones, so the, the, the pink and the orange, so they, they are the different uh, genotypes. So it is very clear what is very useful is we don't have to genotypicize the animal, and this is fantastic because we just see the animals and they are orange and this is a mutant. Obviously, the animals don't have a protein, they don't have gluconeation activity, as you can see here. This is the plasma of the mutant animal that is yellow because of the very high levels of bilirubin. They die very fast, and they have a cerebellar abnormalities, so all these characteristics uh, are the, some of the key features of the human patient. So 
Initially, we, we did a gene targeting approach without the use of nucleases, so based on the introduction of our therapeutic gene, as Michaela explained yesterday, into the albumin locus. So the, this is the characteristic of this contract is that we have two arms of homology that are homologous to the identical to the, to the endogenous mouse albumin genes, and just before the stop colon of the albumin uh, open reading frame, we inserted a peptide 2A that I, I will explain now, and our therapeutic cDNA. When this gets inserted by spontaneous uh, recombination into the albumin gene, this is the structure of the recombinant allele, then it is produced a fuse mRNA always under the control of the albumin promoter, that is the strongest promoter in the liver, uh, and then we have a chimeric mRNA with the two open reading frames separated by this peptide 2A. This peptide 2A is derived from, from viruses and has the characteristic that when the ribosomal, the ribosome arrives during the translation process to this peptide, it stops translation, skips a, a few bases and restarts in the second open reading frame. So in, in such a manner that we are going to have two proteins from the same mRNA. And this is very good because we are not uh, doing a, a knockout of the albumin allele, allele. In any case, albumin has very wide uh, ranges in the, in the blood, so probably will not modify much. And this has been tested originally in, in the original paper by, by the group of, of Mark K. Uh, using hemophilia B uh, mouse model with the factor 9 cDNA. And they obtain therapeutic levels in the mice. So the, the advantage of, of this technique is that we don't use, uh, well, I will go here, sorry. Then we, we apply this uh, technique in our case replacing the therapeutic cDNA by GFP or by UGT1A1 cDNA with the same strategy, so ending up with albumin and UGT or albumin and eGFP. And the advantages of, of this strategy is that we don't use nucleases. So we had a talk yesterday with nucleases telling us how good they are to improve recombination. We also mentioned that they have some problems like uh, immunogenicity and, um, and of target. So the use of a strategy without nucleases in this sense could be good if the, the, the therapeutic levels are high enough. So in this case, the low recombination efficiency is compensated by the high production of the albumin gene. We don't have promoter in our genes, so we don't risk of having insertion and transactivation of, uh, of proto-oncogenes. We don't have immunity against the, the nucleases, and, we, and uh, this is what I mentioned, recombination efficiency could reach about 0.5% or even higher, and the expression is driven by the albumin gene, which is very good. So we did originally some experiments with GFP in which we, we reach some efficiency a bit lower than the one originally obtained by the group of K and, and Bartzell. And you can see here the cells that are recombinant, which is very nice, very curious, is that all the cells are in clusters, <coughs> indicating that the, the, the targeting event occurs soon after uh, dosing, when we, we gave the, the vector to the animal, and then the cells duplicate it and the daughter cells contain the transgene. So it was maintained even after cell duplication. That was the main goal of this approach, as to keep the, the modification of the, of the transgene. But when we did the experiment by treating UGT1A1 animals, uh, we made all animals survive. These are the treated animals. These are the untreated animals. 
that they die a bit later because we are giving some phototherapy just to, to give some a window of time just to the, to, to to allow recombination to occur and then bilirubin level was much lower so it was in the safe range because this is the top, these are the toxic levels more or less that we expect in the animals so all animals survive with bilirubin levels that were in the safe range even 12 months after administration but still they were very different to the wild type levels that should be more or less here between 0 0.5 and 1. So by this reason uh, well, animals, sorry, I forgot this. Animals were okay. We did some uh, behavioral tests at the rotor rod we had seen yesterday. All animals behaved normally, so they have no any uh, abnormalities, uh, at least evidence of abnormalities. But as I mentioned before, the levels were not high enough to think about the therapeutic uh, application of this. So we, treat, we tried with uh, different um, compounds also, as we mentioned, we discussed yesterday, just to increase uh, homodos recombination, and we were not successful, as we mentioned yesterday in the discussion. So we ended up with this strategy that we had seen, using a nuclease to create a, a double strand break, and then to introduce the trans gene into the albumin gene. So the we also took uh, care of the of cleavage, uh, potential of cleavage uh, events. Okay, let's skip. So we use this system, that is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. We were talking yesterday of the Cas9 from Staphylococcus pyogenes. We have used this one because it has essentially the same efficacy it is reported that has the same efficacy as the one of Piogenes, but this is about 1 kb shorter, so it fits much easier inside the, the adenovirus, the loading capacity of adenovirus. Yesterday we have seen the experiment that uh, Professor uh, Walton Booth uh, showed us in which he used interins to remake the full length uh, protein of, of Biogenes uh, Cas9. In this case, we don't need that because we use a, a shorter version that, as it was mentioned before, also it has a more complicated pump sequence. The pump sequence of, of, of the Piogenes is NGG, so it is very easy to find it. In this case, the, the, the pump sequence is a bit more complicated. In any case, we found some pump sites next to, to our uh, stop codon, that is this one. So we tested them using a system, in, in vitro system, by cell transfection in which we have the luciferase uh, gene interrupted by our target region, but the luciferase gene has two duplicated, uh, uh, sequ has duplicated sequences, the FA and FA, for example, and then when double strand break happens here, then stimulates recombination, and then we have the full length luciferase, and we measure the activity indirectly, the cutting activity, efficiency in the cutting activity of the different guide RNAs by measuring luciferase activity. And this is the case, so we selected two guide RNAs, the one that actually worked better was this one, also because it is downstream of the, of the exon in the intron downstream, instead the other one that was working was here, so very close to the exon and to the splice site, so we were afraid that it could affect also the splicing of, of the gene, instead this one is much farther away, so that limiting the, the potential risk. So, we repeated the strategy, but with the addition of the Cas9, in which we also, we have here the palm site, we mutated the palm site obviously in the donor vector to avoid self-targeting, and then we proceed with the same type of strategy, using this time two AAB, one before it was only the donor DNA, now it is the donor DNA plus the Cas9, and it's in the same vector we produce the, the Cas9, we also produce the guide RNA. And we, there are some methods just to determine whether the, the Cas9 is working, and these are the used methods. 
methods normally, the surveyor or T71 decide that they are very comparable methods, PCR and normal sequencing, on PCR of the target sequence and then Illumina sequence. The, the T7E1 assay, assay consists on, we have seen yesterday that if we have repaired here by nonomorphs and joining then we have the introduction of indels and this can be seen if we, if we do uh, denaturation and reannealing, it will result in the formation of heterodimer between the, the sequence that contains the indel and the wild type sequence, and this will be seen by the, by the endonuclease because they are single stranded and will be digested. And when we load an agarose gel or, or just a, a colon, um, a capillary electrophoresis, then we are going to see this is the, the the undigested uh, PCR product, and if we have the presence of index, then we are going to see the bands resulting from the digestion that will correspond to the digestion in the expected site. And this is one of the methods. Another method is what is called the type, in which we do sequence analysis of, of the PCR product of the target site. Uh, and then since there are differences at a certain point in which we have the digestion, we, are, we have to think that we are analyzing a population of a, mix, a mixture of wild type sequences plus mutated sequences, so everything will be okay till the moment in which we have the indel, and when we have the indel, some sequences will be read in the indel and some other molecules will be the wild type, so we are going to have this type of read, and by a computer program, then we can deconvolute uh, this information and, and determine how many molecules contain the indel and how many molecules contain in the, the wild type sequence. And in that manner, we can eventually, at the end, know if the enzyme was, if the Cas9 was working or not. And other approach is just to determine none of target activity, is just to do illumina sequences of, of, the, of, the, of the genomic region in which we expect the, the digestion of, of the enzyme and then doing bioinformatic analysis and then determination of the genome editing rate. So this is what we have done. This is a T71 analysis. You can see here the presence of the digested bands using the, the different uh, guide RNAs that I mentioned. This is in vitro and this is in vivo, so the idea is exactly the same. We have done also on-target analysis. We can see here the analysis of the PCR uh, fragment by Illumina, in which we see that all the, the, the fragments are digested in the expected site that is next to the, to the pump sequence, and we can also measure the frequency of uh, on-target efficacy in the, in the mixture of the PCR. And this is what happened when we use a, an EGFP reporter cDNA. So we inject two, again, the, the two uh, viruses, one containing the donor DNA with the, with the GFP and the other one with the Cas9 plus the guide RNA, and we obtain about 13, 14 percent in average of recombinant hepatocytes. So it means that of the 100 hepatocytes, we have 13 percent that are GFP positive, and this is a, a very good number. In some animals, we, we had about 24, 25 percent of uh, recombinant uh, hepatocytes. The amount of protein we have is very, is very high. And then obviously there is a correlation between the, the amount of mRNA and the amount of um, the, the protein. And the same happens when we test it with the factor 9 uh, reporter cDNA. These are wild type animals as well. We are now doing the experiment uh, in factor 9 uh, in hemophilia B mice. And uh, we obtain, even after 10 months after administration, animals were injected at P2 
postnatal day two, we obtain uh, recombinant levels, levels of the recombinant factor nine that were much higher than the normal levels found in the human population, that is 100. In some cases, we obtained more than 200% of uh, factor nine levels. So this means that it is very efficient. We have seen before that 30% is, is more than enough. So even if we, we have levels that are lower than this, is very therapeutic uh, or should be very therapeutic in, in, in animals. And what happened when we did the, um, the experiment in the Krigler Najar mice? So when we did the experiment there, the strategy is exactly the same. We injected the animals at T2. We treated the animals with phototherapy for a short period, just to, to allow recombination to occur, avoiding the presence of potential brain damage during this period. And then all animals survived, non-treated animals died, Bilirubin levels were identical to wild type in this case, so were between 0 and 0 0.5 for all the duration of, of the experiment. Even we sacrificed the animals and, at 10 months, and here is the western blot of uh, the same amount of liver extract that we loaded here in the wild type. This is a 100% that we see in wild type, and here is the amount of protein that we see in, in those animals. Uh, so it is about five, between four and five times more UGT enzyme than the one that is present in the wild type animals. So it, it means that the, the efficacy in the production of, of UGT protein driven by the albumin promoter is really very important. We counted the cells by using a specific antibody against the human UGT protein, and we have seen that about 3-4% of the cells uh, were positive. Obviously, there is a difference between, uh, it is clear difference between the UGT transgene and the GSP. The length of the transgenes is different. This is much longer than the UGT, and probably this is more or less in the limit of the, of the um, cargo capacity of the AAB, so probably the quality of the virus is not exactly the same as the quality of, of, the, of the virus containing the, the GSP protein. Uh, we also did some safety analysis, so the studies in, in the cerebellum show that there is no deficiency in, or no abnormality in the brain. Purkinje cells are exactly the same as in the, in the wild type animals. Liver is absolutely normal. Uh, the levels of albumin in plasma are identical to the, to the, pre, the levels of albumin in wild type animals. We, since the, the pump site of, of this uh, Staphylococcus aureus is more complicated, we did a prediction analysis and the number of off-target sites was much lower than what normally is obtained using the Piogenes uh, Cas9. So we selected, the, there were four a potential off-target sites that uh, could be analyzed from these three uh, were uh, coding genes and one was in intragenic region that we didn't analyze because there was in the region without known function and known genes. So this we, we didn't analyze and we didn't see any type we, well, uh, probably you don't see here any type of off-target effect uh, due to the, to the nucleus. And since a problem, as, as uh, <coughs> Michaela mentioned yesterday, the one problem is the presence of the nucleus in the long run. We also did some Western blot analysis of the nucleus and we see that it fades out at least. The detection of this Western blot is not so high, I, I admit that, but it fades out probably associated to the dilution of the, or to the loss of vector DNA during a liver growth. And next step will be to use a type of approach like uh, the self-targeting uh, nuclease or to deliver the nuclease as, uh, as we were discussing, to deliver the nuclease as mRNA or protein just in, in such a manner that it enters the liver and then makes the job and then disappear because it is degraded. 
So just to conclude, so we are saying it up to 15% of recombinant hepatocytes in the case of uh, GSP, 4% in the case of UGC. So we are seeing very high levels of uh, protein uh, with long-term efficacy. 10 months for a mouse is, is a long-term efficacy, even what well, mice live about two years. We fully rescue the, the phenotype with no abnormalities, no changes in albumin level, and not detected of target activity in predicted sites. So as I mentioned before, we are testing the, the, the strategy in hemophilia B animals, and also we are doing uh, experiments also in citrullinemia that I, Michaela mentioned yesterday, that is a urea cyclic de defect. And the, the, what is very important also, since this is working apparently so nicely, we could, uh, we have the idea just to convert the liver in a kind of factory to produce therapeutic proteins that could be used in the, to replace enzyme replacement therapy in, in specific diseases. So this is more or less all. Uh, so I would like to thank just the people who did the work. So the, the part of the without nucleases was done by Javier <coughs> Laporro and uh, Julia Bartolucci. And then <coughs> the, the part with nucleases by Alessia de Caneva and also Michela and also Julia and, uh, and Fabi, uh, Ricardo, so uh, with everybody. So thanks for your attention. If you have questions, thank you.